back during the years when our four boys were growing up, Sunday night was always family night. <clears throat> and over the years, we, we developed a number of traditions for our family night. For example, we'd always have a family meeting where we would talk about whatever the boys were learning in Sunday school that some of you were teaching. We'd look at their Sunday school papers. We'd talk about the week ahead. And some of those family meetings went better than others, but we'd have them. And then after that, mom would go make popcorn. I would make my famous homemade peanut butter chocolate milkshakes, which are awesome, by the way. And then we would usually watch about a half an hour of TV, something like the Discovery Channel with animals and so forth. Uh, and then we'd have a family prayer time. I still remember this one particular Sunday night <clears throat> when our boys were quite young, maybe ages seven, five, two, and a baby. And we were at the point of our family evening when we were watching TV, you know, uh, something about killer whales or dolphins or something. And mom got up to go make the popcorn. And she got back a few minutes later, and we were all five boys, uh, me including the baby and three other boys, just lounging around the family room with pillows on the couch, laying on the floor, eyes glued to whatever was happening on TV. And mom came back a few minutes later with, with uh, four separate bowls of popcorn for each of, the, of us four older boys, and obviously the baby didn't have any, but she, we had our each individualized bowl of popcorn. Now, we received them like um, ancient Mesopotamian kings. <laughs> we were just lounging, <laughs> got our popcorn, now, none of us had volunteered to go in and help her make the popcorn. None of us had volunteered to help carry the popcorn into the family room. And none of us even thought to say thank you, except the two-year-old. The two-year-old immediately piped up with this joyful, spontaneous expression, thanks for the popcorn, Mommy. And the other of us knew immediately we were exposed. And so we scrambled to sort of uh, offer our day late, dollar short, you know, oh, hon, thanks for the popcorn. Thanks, Mom. Uh, but it, it sort of fell flat uh, because we'd been exposed. Our lack of gratitude was obvious. Now, today we begin a summer series called The Disciplines of Grace. And when you saw those two words, uh, maybe you had this reaction. Those words don't sound like they go together. Uh, the word discipline uh, makes us think of things that are hard, hard things, things that take effort and commitment and concentration, like um, the discipline of trying to lose weight, or the discipline of, of getting in shape. On the other hand, we think of grace as something good, something, something effortless and something beautiful, like a gift, kind of like chocolate cake. So how is discipline needed to enjoy grace? Why would anyone need discipline to enjoy chocolate cake. But we put these two words together on purpose because discipline really means to learn. A disciplined person is one who learns, and grace is something God is trying to give us all the time in many different ways. And the truth is we often, for many reasons, struggle to understand, experience, and enjoy the very grace God is trying to give us. We have to learn. So that's what we're going to try to do this summer through this series called The Disciplines of Grace. And today we begin with the discipline of gratitude. We're going to look at just one story today. It comes to us in Luke's Gospel, chapter 17. The story takes place toward the end of Jesus' earthly life. So Jerusalem and the cross are not that far away. I'll begin in verse 11 of Luke 17. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. Now I need to stop there for a point of interest. You know if you're on a family trip and there's a little, one of those little um, placards on a, a sign on the side of the road, there's always someone in the family who wants to stop and read that, right? Well, that's what we're doing now, point of interest. Whenever Luke or another gospel writer gives a, a kind of a nuanced geographical detail, it's important to pay attention to. So here's what's going on here. Take a look at this map. Galilee, where Jesus' sort of home base was, uh, Nazareth, Sea of Galilee and all that, was up north, way to the north in Israel. Jerusalem is way to the south, see that? And in between was this region called Samaria. Now you may remember that there was a centuries-long animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. So most often if a Jew needed to walk from, travel from Galilee in the north to Jerusalem in the south, they would take a detour around Samaria, either to the east or the west, so they wouldn't have to come into contact with Samaritans because that was a problem. 
You might even recall one time Jesus violated that tradition when he walked straight through Samaria because he was on his way to meet the woman at the well who was a Samaritan woman. It's a beautiful story. In this story, it seems like he's preparing to walk around Samaria because see that blue line at the top? That's the border area Luke's talking about. Sort of a no man's land between Galilee, where the Jews lived, and Samaria, where the Samaritans lived. So Jesus is seemingly walking on purpose along that borderline area. Now, why would Luke mention this so specifically? Well, we're going to find that out in just a moment. Verse 12. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. Now, the word leprosy literally in the language means scaly or rough. Ten scaly men. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. He was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Now this is a very short story. It's kind of a pithy story. It reads almost like a parable. And in it we see uh, three movements, as it were. The first thing we see is the disease. The disease. I don't know about you, but middle school was not one of my favorite seasons of life. Just out of curiosity, how many if you, of you, if you could, would voluntarily go back to middle school? Anybody? I didn't think so. Now, there might be middle schoolers here this morning. Is anybody here today who's in middle school? Okay. Let me just say this. While middle school may not be an awesome season of life for many of us, middle schoolers, we believe, are awesome. And they matter to us. They matter to our church. They matter to Pastor Andrew, our middle school pastor. They matter to... God, you matter to God because God has wonderful plans to use you for his purpose. So we're glad you're here if you're a middle schooler. But when I was in about sixth grade or so, what we would have called middle school, I learned that middle school could be a pretty cruel place. Because what I learned was if there was anything that made you different, made you stand out in some way, maybe the size of your body, the shape of your body, your hair, you wore eyeglasses, you had braces, you had acne, anything at all, Anything that could be made fun of usually was made fun of. And I remember in sixth grade, there was a little girl in our class named Margaret Rubenstein. We called her Peggy, Peggy Rubenstein. And Peggy had several things that made her different. She was really, really small. She looked like a third grader. She wore teardrop eyeglasses that she wore in a a band around her neck. And she was really, really smart, as opposed to the rest of us. And for... Reasons that were not her fault at all. That year, she became kind of a target. Kind of a target for teasing, making fun. You'd probably call it bullying today. I remember feeling kind of bad for her during that year, but, and I don't think I participated in any of the cruel stuff, but I don't think I did anything to stop it really either. And I remember one day in particular, we were outside playing kickball. Remember kickball? Big round red ball we'd use, and we're at recess or gym class or something, and, and uh, Peggy's turn came up to to kick, and the pitcher, I guess we call him a pitcher, was this giant kid named Carl, and he was one of these early maturing guys, you know, beard, mustache in sixth grade, just big, (laughs) giant guy, and he rolls the ball to Peggy, and Peggy was so small and light, she must have weighed 50 pounds, she went to kick the ball, and she barely could nub it back to the pitcher, to Carl. Now, in kickball, the way you get someone out is you throw the ball at them, remember? Carl picked up that ball took aim, and just winged it, hit Peggy right in the back of the head, knocked her in the air, she landed on her face, glasses flew off, she skidded to a stop, and you know what everyone did? They laughed. We laughed. Because Peggy had become a leper. She'd become different in some way. Some 30 years later or so, I was at a class reunion, the only class reunion I've been back to, for my graduating class, and I saw Peggy. I recognized her. 30 years later, I recognized her. And the first thought I had was that kickball game. So I walked up to her. I had to reintroduce myself. And I said, Peggy, something's bothered me for a long time. I need to... She stopped me. She said, I know what you're going to say. I said, no, I, 
I need to apologize for that day because I, 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 I didn't stop it. And I should have. And she laughed. She said, we were just kids. But she remembered that day too, all those years later. Luke says, verse 11, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. Notice, they're not identified as Jews or Samaritans. They're unified by their disease, leprosy. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Now, several things here. First, the disease is called leprosy. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Luke also says there were ten men. This would indicate they lived together in a colony, away from the village, away from the clean, healthy folks. They're in that that no man's land between for a reason. They're a leper colony says they stood at a distance. We can just skip over this, but there's a lot of meaning and pain in those words. Now today, leprosy, often called Hansen's disease, has pretty much been eliminated from the Western world. It still exists in places like India. It's completely treatable, but back in that day, it was one of the most feared diseases of the ancient world. world. Uh, the, the Greek word lepros that's used here referred to a number of uh, infectious skin diseases from what we would call psoriasis all the way to full-blown leprosy. And the symptoms of leprosy usually began with with white, scaly patches, which is why it was called that. Uh, It would spread to then to the peripheral parts of the body, hands, feet, face, earlobes. Lepers would eventually experience a disfigurement, uh, a a twisting of the limbs and a curling of the fingers. Uh, This is one of the pictures I could show you that's easier to look at. There are plenty I could have shown you that were very difficult to look at. Uh, But leprosy then infected the the, the nervous system, eventually compromised the body's ability to feel pain. Now, not to be able to feel pain might sound good, but it's a terrible thing. Because the leper could step on a shard of pottery and cut his or her foot and not know it and get infected. The whole limb becomes at risk. A leper's body, and I didn't know this before this week, would eventually take on a, a, a state of living decomposition as the flesh began to deteriorate. So there was a stench around a a single leper and around, particularly around a colony of lepers. On average, it took about nine years for leprosy to run its course, and a leper almost always died a horrible death, and they died alone. But perhaps even worse than the physical symptoms and suffering was the social and spiritual impact of the disease. Listen to these words from Leviticus chapter 13. The instructions given to the ancient people of Israel. Then the priest shall examine him, and if the disease swelling is reddish white on his bald head or on his bald forehead, like the appearance of leprous disease in the skin of the body, he is a leprous man. He is unclean. The priest must pronounce him unclean. His disease is on his head. The leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. So what did it mean to be a leper? Well, first it meant to be regarded as unclean. Now, it's almost impossible for us to imagine the impact of being regarded that way with that word, unclean, in that culture. It meant to be physically and spiritually contaminated. It meant that you couldn't touch anyone because if you touched a clean person, they became contaminated. You couldn't walk into someone's home because the whole home would become contaminated because you were dangerous, you were unclean. Secondly, it meant the leper was to live outside the camp. They were sent away from family and friends, never to return. Thirdly, it meant there were all kind of legal and social restrictions. A leper had to shout the word unclean to warn the healthy population that a leper was near. A leper couldn't come within 50 feet of a healthy person lest they risk being stoned to death. A Jewish historian named Josephus said that a leper was to be treated as a dead man. In fact, it was common for families of lepers to to at some point hold a funeral for them even though they yet lived in the colony. So it's almost impossible for us to imagine the kind of outcast that a leper was then in our day. Uh, The closest we might come is thinking of someone who had been identified as an HIV AIDS patient back in the early days when we became aware of that disease, or maybe a word like prostitute, uh, maybe sex offender, or maybe ex-convict 
something like that. A leper would be among the most marginalized of all human beings, the people that no one wants to look at or see, let alone touch or love. So picture these men, disfigured, their stench going before them in ragged, torn clothing, and they, sh- they shout, not unclean, but what they shout, Luke says, is, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Now, this is interesting. They use the word master. This is the only place in Luke's gospel where anyone other than the 12 disciples calls Jesus master. Just interesting. They knew something about him. They knew something about who he was. Maybe they had heard. Maybe they were hoping against hope. But they cry out master, and then what they ask for is not healing. They ask for pity. Pity. Just have compassion. Help us. It's a cry of absolute desperation. Now, if we go back to how Luke introduced this little story, remember? He said Jesus walked along the border between Samaria and Galilee. Now we know why he's doing that. He went there intentionally just to encounter these ten broken, desperate, outcast men. First thing we see is the disease. The second thing we see in the story is the healing. The healing. Now let me ask you a question that might make you uncomfortable. How many of you are allergic to poison ivy? Okay. I read where 85% of North Americans are allergic to poison ivy. Well, you'll break out if you you rub up against it. Now I want to ask you, do you remember the last time you had a bad case? You know, maybe you were golfing, you're out working in the garden, and a couple days later you noticed the red rash and the, the, the itching and the burning. Remember? Okay, remember your last case, and then multiply it by like 10. I want you to imagine being really, really uncomfortable. You're miserable. You can't sleep. You can't go out in public because your arms and legs are covered. You, you, can't, you can't cover yourself up enough. You don't want to touch anybody. You don't want to be touched by anybody. It's, it's just awful. So you go to your doctor hoping for some relief, and your doctor takes one look at you and doesn't say, hey, here's a prescription for a miracle cream you can put on. It'll be gone in two days. Or give you, it doesn't give you a shot of some sort of magical steroid. It doesn't even bandage up your, 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 your poison ivy. He just says, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home. I want you to put on your, your best new bathing suit. I want you to go to the nearest public pool and just show yourself to everybody. <laughs> You'd be like, what? That's what happens here. Verse 14. When he saw them, he said, go show yourself to the priests. Now, a couple things here. It says, when he saw them. Now, we can just jump right over that. Maybe he's just you know, describing a physical thing that happened. He physically, with his eyes, saw them. Maybe. But I think there might be something deeper here. You know how when you're in Chicago and you're walking along the sidewalk and you become aware there's a person sitting on a on a piece of cardboard, maybe with a cup out in front of them or a bowl, and they're they're panhandling, and you see it and you you're tempted to look the other way, aren't you? You're tempted to kind of look over here because I I don't really want to if I look and I'm going to be sort of obligated. uh, Here Jesus does exactly the opposite, I think. He he sees them. He's in fact gone there in just to see these men that no one else wants to look at, that no one else wants to touch. He goes there, he sees, because he cares and he knows. Now, it's possible that someone's here today who, in this season of life, for whatever reason, has felt sort of invisible or unseen. Maybe by those in your family, maybe by God himself, just unimportant unseen. Well, this story tells us something. It tells you something. It tells you that Jesus sees. He sees you. He knows. He cares. That's why he came. And then we see, he says, go show yourself to the priests. Now, this is a pretty risky thing. Because the priests were the ones who sent them to the colony in the first place. The priests were responsible for the well-being of the whole community. So they functioned sort of like the medical examiners. If if they examined you and said you had leprosy, they sent you away. But they were also the ones that could declare you clean again if you had been healed. And you could move back home. Okay? So he says, go show yourself to the priests. Now notice, Jesus doesn't do anything here, doesn't say anything here to indicate that he's going to heal them. In Mark chapter 8, you may remember, there's a story where Jesus heals a leper by touching the leper. Remember? He touches the man, and immediately he becomes clean. He doesn't do that here. You may remember in John 9, 
he, he spits on the ground and makes some mud and rubs it on a blind man's eyes and tells him to go wash off in the pool and the man is healed. He doesn't do that here. He just sees them and he speaks to them. Go, right now, covered with sores, show yourself to the priests. It's a crazy thing to say to a leprous man. You only went back to the priest if you were already clean. So why does Jesus do it this way? We don't really know. Luke doesn't tell us. Maybe he wanted them to just trust him. They had called him master after all. Maybe he just wants them to believe. Luke says, as they went, as they went, they were cleansed. Now I think, I think this part of the story is also about us in a way. It's about me. It's about you. Not because we have leprous sores or poison ivy on our bodies, but because we're all kind of like lepers in a way. Meaning that we all are unclean in some way. That we all have parts of ourselves that we hide. We hide from others. Parts of ourselves that are untouchable. Like if I were to ask you what's the most untouchable thing about you or what's the part of you that feels most unclean, you would think of something. What, what do, you, do you harbor inside yourself, in the deepest parts of your heart, that if others were to see it, you're pretty sure they would turn away in disgust? We all know what that is. Maybe some secret sin, maybe some shame that clings to us like a festering sore, maybe anger, maybe fear, something. The question we are asked today is, do you call him master? And if you call him master, do you believe he can make you clean? Do you know that he can make clean again. Luke says, as they went, they were cleansed. Now that word refers to a ceremonial cleanness. That is, the external symptoms of the disease disappeared. So we have the disease, and we have the healing, and the third thing we see is the response. Verse 15, one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Now, there are all kinds of things in these two verses. First thing I see is that gratitude begins with humility. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. Only a humble man can be that grateful. Throwing himself at Jesus' feet. Now, notice, it's a desperate kind of thanksgiving. I don't know if that's the right word for it or not, but it seems desperate. It says he cries in a loud voice, praise to God. Remember how they cried out to Jesus earlier? Luke says the same word, loud voice. He begged for mercy. And once he had received it, he offered the same kind of desperate gratitude. Begins with humility. Secondly, gratitude is worship. Jesus says, has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Jesus links gratitude with praise and worship. In fact, I think the Bible tells us that worship is impossible without gratitude. It's impossible. Psalm 100, verse 4, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. We can't begin to even experience the presence of God without an attitude of thanksgiving and gratitude. I think I could also, if I had time, use Scripture to demonstrate that prayer itself is impossible without gratitude. I think I could demonstrate that joy is impossible without gratitude. For joy cannot inhabit a heart that is ungrateful. In fact, the lack of gratitude is a mark of godlessness. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 1. For although they knew God, they, did, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. But there's also something else going on here I want you to see. Verse 17, Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Now here's the zinger in the story. In Jesus' stories in the New Testament, there's almost always a zinger. Don't stop reading and thinking until you find the zinger because it's there. Here's the zinger. The disciples who were walking with Jesus most likely at this time would have seen it immediately. They would have been stunned, might have started shuffling, looking at the ground because it would have been embarrassing. Jesus has to have our full attention right here because he says there were 10 of them. There were 10 desperate, leprous men. All 10 were healed. All 10 were made clean. Only one returns to give thanks. Now we find ourselves thinking, 
Really? Really? Nine out of ten did not return? I mean, these were lepers. They had festering sores. They're losing their fingers and their toes. They're doomed to die a stinking, horrible death alone. And nine of them don't come back? Now, if we think that, we haven't found ourselves in the story yet because we're there. Then we see that the one who returns is a Samaritan. This means he was a double outcast. He was a Samaritan that the Jews thought of as unclean to begin with, and he was a leper. Absolutely unimaginable that Jesus would even speak to this man, let alone heal him of his disease. And to this man, Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Now, wait a second. Hadn't he already been made clean? Hadn't the leprosy already disappeared when he was on his way to the priests? What does it mean that Jesus now says your faith has made you well? Well, the word he uses there means healed, made well, or saved. Your faith has saved you. See, Jesus here is not talking about an outward physical cleansing to make someone ceremonial clean by the law. He's talking about an inner healing, a transformation of the heart. And this is the gospel in this story. Not an external superficial cleansing, but a deeper internal transformation of the heart. This is what Paul talks about in Colossians chapter 2 when he writes, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. The gospel always, the gospel always produces overflowing thankfulness. Now here's a question. Why then are we so often, speaking to myself here too, why are, then are we so often among the nine and not the one? I notice it in myself when I pray. I'll pray, I'll ask God for things that are good, my family, my kids, the church, for people I care about. And when he gives good things, sometimes I forget to go back. And I throw myself at his feet in gratitude. I forget. Why do we forget? Well, I think because we live in a culture that is profoundly ungrateful. We are taught from the time we are little that we don't have enough stuff, that we need more stuff that we've got to have more, that somehow God is holding good stuff back from us because other people have stuff that we don't have. But gratitude, we see in this story, is a spiritual choice. Gratitude is a discipline. Is it harsh? No. It's good. It's the gateway to worship and praise and joy and cleansing. It's grace. It's like chocolate cake. But we need to learn. We have to learn to enjoy it. We're going to close each one of our messages this summer in this series with a kind of application or personal challenge, really, if you choose to participate. And this week, we're going to talk to you and push you in the, in the discipline of gratitude. What we want you to do, among other things, whatever you decide, but what we want you to do is every day take a few moments, whether you do this typically in the morning or the evening or lunchtime, doesn't matter. But take a few moments, a piece of paper, take your bulletin with you, take a journal, whatever you have, and then prayerfully consider something that you're profoundly grateful for. Write it down. And you've got to come up with five things every day. Just five. And every day you have to have the new five. You can't repeat any of them. Every day. See what God does as you discipline yourself and learn the grace of gratitude. A couple of days ago, I noticed a Facebook post. I don't go on Facebook a whole lot, but this was a good one. A friend of mine, uh, maybe of yours too, named Karen Harper, made a post. I asked her if I could share part of it. She said I could. Most of you remember that Karen's husband, John, was our facilities manager here at Chapel Street for about 10 years or so, and he passed away suddenly last July. This past week, June 6th, uh, was 
their wedding anniversary. It was her first anniversary without John in her life, at least not physically. And this was her Facebook post. Celebrating my first wedding anniversary without John, but so incredibly blessed to have friends share a traditional, now non-traditional anniversary dinner with me, to share the sweet memories I have of my amazing husband. Another first that ended the same way as it has for the past 27 years. Humble gratitude to God who put the two of us together in the first place. To God be the glory. It struck me that that's what it means to be the one. That's the discipline of gratitude. Would you bow with me as I close? Lord Jesus, how we thank you for this beautiful little story. We thank you for being the one who sees knows and heals the outcast, the broken, the leper. Thank you also for the one nameless man who returned to give thanks. And teach us this grace of gratitude. Teach us to grow ever more grateful for your work in us. And through gratitude, to grow also in praise and in prayer and in the joy that you so want us to know. It's in your name, the name of Jesus, that we pray.